Hi, this is Dr. Patrick Cohn for the Golf Psychology Podcast. Today I have a very special guest. His name is Rick Sessinghaus. Rick and I go back quite a while to about 2004, 2005 when he took the MGCP certification program. And since then, he's been, uh, he's been on fire. He's a, he's a golf performance coach who he combines his uh, expertise with the swing coach and mental game coach. And he's also worked with a two-time major winner, Colin Mordekawa, since he was eight years old. Wow, geez, Rick, that's crazy. And he was also voted top 50 golf instructor in the US. And he's the author of The Ultimate Mind Game. And he's recently launched Flow Code, which is very interesting. I've seen it myself. It looks great. That's at flowcode.com. Rick, golf. thanks for... Oh, I'm sorry, dot .golf. <laughs> Thanks for correcting me on that. Flowcode.golf, <laughs> where you can get, I guess, everything mental, physical, spiritual. <laughs> well, it's going down that road. But first off, thanks so much, uh, Patrick, for having me on. Yes, we go back a long way. And you were very uh, influential in, in how I got my mental game uh, coaching started with my business. I learned so much from the program of how to assess and, and, and also build a business, right? I mean, you and I are certainly going to talk about some mental game tools and techniques, but I think for those coaches out there, you know, building a business is different than just having those skill sets. So I, I've always appreciated what you brought to me to get my, my career going. Yes. You know, and I struggled myself early on coming out of school. It's like, what do I do now? You know, it's like, how do I do a business? Um, very, very difficult for, us, you could say PhDs, it's like we flounder once we get out because it's a teaching degree. You know, you come out of a PhD program, it's really a teaching degree. Um, you got a lot of information, but then if you want to go out and start your own business, it's kind of tough. Let's talk about the mental game. I know you work with juniors, you work with tour pros. Is the approach different, do you think, uh, working with a young golfer who's still working on his mechanics, still trying to find a swing? Uh, or you're helping them, you know, find a swing versus a tour pro who maybe, you know, the swing mechanics are a little bit more set and they're not, mm -hmm. not really growing or, or changing their approach. No, it's a great question. I think my philosophy has definitely evolved. Uh, I think at first I thought they were two different entirely, right? An intermediate golfer, junior golfer compared to a tour pro and, and yes, there might be some language changes with a junior golfer, right? You want to talk more of their language. But as I've gone along, I think all of us as people, we observe the environment same way. Sometimes there's fear, sometimes there's confidence, sometimes there's distractions. And so I don't really look at the level of the golfer from their skill set standpoint. I, I have worked with some very good players, some very good college players who were insecure, who had distractions, who had doubts. And I've had junior golfers who were fully confident, fully ready to go, right? So I look at it from a state dependent standpoint is what's the state they're in as they execute a golf shot mentally, emotionally, physically. And so I really start with a pretty much the same philosophy with them. Um, they may have different experiences that we would tap into, but I, I pretty much look at it the same way as state management. So interesting. You mentioned the fear. Some golfers maybe just have that fear. Other golfers don't have that fear. So what do you think is that? I mean, is that nature, nurture? I mean, so do they come into golf with already having those fears or can they be come from a coach or parents or teachers that tend to instill some of those fear, fear of making mistakes, fear of shooting a bad round? Um, from your experience, what do you find that the, the kids that come in to the system and are, are fearless and don't have those challenges of, performing under pressure. Yeah, no, you hit it right on the head is that I think it's unfortunately something learned from a parent or a coach. When you, you have an eight, nine, 10 year old who's learning golf for the first time, they are childlike, they're play, they're playful. They hit what we would consider a poor golf shot. They just want to hit another one and they want to try something different in a flop shot. And, and they're very creative, childlike, and there's really not much of that self-critical voice happening. They want to get better because it's something to play. And then as they start playing in tournaments and coaches and um, parents have expectations, and I know that's something you and I have talked about before, is we start setting expectations for these juniors that, oh, I'm supposed to shoot a certain score. If I do, great, I get this nice positive feedback from my parents. 
If I don't, then I get criticized and why didn't it happen and stuff. And so there's becomes this chasm that the results is all that they're being graded on now. And so then those that become, they unfortunately maybe have a few poor rounds and they see how their parents or coaches react. They go, Oh, oh I don't want that. So they do become fear, fearful of those results and they don't put themselves out there. I encourage failure. I encourage learning from shots and tournaments and stuff. And I think that's what, you know, Colin Morikawa has done a great job with is that he didn't always dominate junior golf, but he was always learning and going, okay, we need to do this a little bit better. We didn't play well in the wind or, Hey, I got to learn to play better on these fast greens. It wasn't just the score. It was more of the process behind how you played that I think he embraced that I'm trying to, as a coach, I know you are too, is like, how were you on the golf course? Were you going through your routines? Were you committed? Were you, you know, that those questions aren't asked very often. It's more, you shot this because you did three putts. You got to work on your three putts. And, and then there'd be a lot of negative um, anchoring to the result. And I do believe, unfortunately, those 13, 14, 15 year olds, it does become fearful of what they don't want a lot more than what they want. I'm really interested in how you integrate, you know, the, as a swing coach, and also as a mental coach, to me, it's often like those are two, I see them as two separate animals altogether. It's like you're either working on your swing to make it more consistent and be able to trust it on the golf course, or you're working more on the mental game and some of the mental game challenges, or just learning how to be more consistent sure. with the mental game. So, so how do you integrate those? Do you wear <laughs> one hat and then another hat? Or where is the, where's the crossover um, when, you're, when you're doing that? It's Jekyll and Hyde, I guess. I'm, I'm bouncing back and forth with that. I, when I first started teaching about 27 years ago and I, I was more just a mechanical coach, I was highly technical. So about the angles and about the cause and effects and biomechanics and stuff like that. And that served me well, don't get me wrong. Um, as I went more into the mental game, right? As, as I went through your certification, as, as I learned more ways of being a better coach. See, teaching a golf swing is teaching, I needed to be a better coach. And part of coaching, I think, is getting in the environment of the student and, and getting more into what are they experiencing, okay? So I have now kind of gone more of like, what back to, I'm going back to performance state. What state are you in when you're on the golf course? What state are you in when you're on the range? What state are you in in a lesson? And those might be three completely different states mentally, emotionally, and physically, okay? So how can we expect the golf swing, the mechanical stuff, to show up the same way. I don't think you can. If, if I'm fearful and tense and, and my grip pressure gets tight and I get quick, or I'm relaxed and calm and confident and I'm feeling flowy, those are different states that the golf swing is going to be affected by. So I am always, I, even in a golf lesson, I am being very aware of the state that the golfer's in in the moment, okay? I want them to learn, right? And I think part of learning is so they're not stressed, they're not being critical, they're not, you know, judgmental. It's like, no, let's experience this. And like, hey, that ball went to the right. Hmm. What in that golf swing you think produced that? And I want them to come back. Yeah, Rick, we've talked about this before. The club face was a little open. And so then at that point, is the club face open because it was mechanical or is it because they're steering the ball because it's mental? So that is a question that is always spinning in my head. Okay. And I think more of my lessons are now hybrid models. They, they are, they're coming to improve their golf game. I want to get to, is this a cause and effect because it's just mechanics or is it because of the state they're in? And that's what intrigues me about it. Yeah. Well, I worked with a guy named Grant Waite. You probably know back yes. in the middle, uh, probably in the nineties, he was a tour winner and he would say, well, when I finish working on my swing, then I can come and I can work on the mental game with you. It's like, so there's always this, this search for the, the perfect swing and consistent yeah. swing before golfers say, now I'm ready to tweak my mental game once I, I finish the work with the mechanics. Are they ever finished? I don't think they are. I, I think that's the, and it depends on the personality types, right? So you have some very analytical players who are more into perfectionistic tendencies that everything has to look good. Their ground force things have to be good. Track man numbers have to be zeroed out and all this stuff. And I think they're, for my opinion, they're going down the wrong road because they're not learning how to play better golf. They're, they're learning how to make a golf swing that hits positions. Um, I think if, you know, if you ask Colin, who's now won six times worldwide, two majors, um, I would say half of those wins, he probably was very, very free of swing thoughts. 
Okay. I'm not saying he had none, but it might be just tempo based. Um, and then he won an event um, against J Justin Thomas in a playoff, the work day, where he uh, had a swing thought that week. Okay. But I want to make it clear it's a swing thought, not five different variables that you're thinking about in the golf in a golf swing. So I think we have to get people away from being perfect. I use the word excellence now, right? It's like, I want you to play excellent golf. I want you to swing with excellence, but perfect already gets them in a mindset that, that anything can always be better and tweaked. And then the other part is like, when is good, good enough? How can I manage my game to say, Hey, my driver's a little bit dispersion is going a little more right today. Hey, let's play that. Let's move it left. But I do know my putting's really well going really well today. I'm feeling that we have to play the game. And that's what I, I, you know, seeing these great players week in and week out is rarely do they have their a plus game, you know, but they still find a way to get it around. Or maybe they have that one bad day that for one tour player means a 74, but these elite players, it means 71. They, but their mechanics were the same, but how they got around the golf course uh, was differently. So they saved that bad round. So those are the things that I look at. Um, but you're right. It, 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 and unfortunately, I'm seeing that more and more because we have all this technology and we have all these things that people get sucked into. That's what leads to lower scores. And, and again, my bias is that no, it doesn't. There's another element here of how we think and how we prepare and, and our strategy that has a, I believe a bigger determinant than if my track man number is zeroed out type of a thing. Yeah. Well, as an instructor like yourself, I think the crossover with the mental game and the instruction is really when to do the instruction and when to focus on the mental game. So I would assume you're more focused on playing the golf course strategically, the mental preparation before tournaments, but then doing most of your work in the off season when it comes to the swing mechanics. I remember another guy I worked with, EJ Fister, who was an NCAA champion back in around 90, 91. Um, he qualified, I helped him get on tour. And then he said, my swing's not good enough. I don't have a tour swing. Guess what? I don't, I don't know if he made many cuts uh, that year when he got on tour and he certainly didn't keep his card. So maybe that's the big crossover as an instructor like yourself is knowing when to come in and discuss some of the mechanical changes because I see you at tournaments, you're working with these guys at tournaments. So um, this is probably a two part question. That is, are you keeping it simple and just reinforcing what they're doing well? Exactly. So on, a, on site, you know, if I show up on a Monday with Colin, um, Monday, Tuesday, if we need to do anything mechanical, that's when we do it. Okay. And we have a very, because I've worked with him since he's eight years old, we pretty much know his patterns already physically. So we won't even talk mental right now, but if his pattern, let's say the ball is overcutting, Okay. And it's happening on the range, not on the course. We probably have a mechanical thing, right? He's not nervous on the range. He's not. So we go, huh, how can we shrink that dispersion? What's the cause and effect mechanically, right? Monday, Tuesday would be maybe to clean some of those things up. And as you mentioned, then it becomes simpler and simpler as we get closer to Thursday. So Wednesday, kind of one of our rules that we've only broken once is no mechanics on Wednesday, right? He has a pro-am. It's more of now uh, thinking through shots, visualizing him and his caddy, JJ, are starting to communicate a little bit more as if they were in a tournament. Um, we're certainly trying to lock into more of a competitive mode, even though a pro-am is, yeah, you're there for the ams and stuff like that. We're, we're trying to go from mechanics Monday, Tuesday to more performance to now Thursday, you're ready to rock and roll, okay? Um, and yes, you're right. You do want to emphasize to me, you want to emphasize on Wednesday, hey, things are good. Hey, that looks good. That was a great swing because I want less thinking and I want to help solidify somebody's confidence going into it. So they're not thinking, oh yeah, but this, but this. And then before you know it, Wednesday night, they're still thinking of, oh my gosh, things are not where they need to be because that's not a great place to be come Thursday morning. Yeah, I don't think, you know, across the board, junior, collegiate, professionals, I don't think they get that concept of it's not about tweaking the swing right up to the tournament. It's about, you know, your, as you said, your state, your mindset, figuring out how to play the golf course, um, working on, you know, your touch around the greens and stuff like that. I still think that golfers get that wrong. I agree. And you just said something like that, touch around the greens, right? The, the obsession with 
my golf swing has to look a certain way. And yes, hitting a good drive, having good approach shots with proximity to the hole is super important. Don't get me wrong. We're still going to miss greens and we're still going to have to hit and hit chip shots from the rough. We're going to still have to feel what the bunkers are. Right. And so I see people so obsessed with swing, their preparation is horrible because they haven't gone out to hit the different shots that they may have that week. Um, I know I've learned this the hard way is, you know, preparing in, in Los Angeles where I live and then being with Colin in Florida, we have different grasses. Well, we, I didn't pick up on that quick enough. And now we do Monday, Tuesday. Hey, we're on Bermuda. This is type Bermuda. Let's hit this type of chip shot, right? That's what's needed is the environment that you're going to be in that. And it has maybe nothing to do with golf swing. Okay. And that's part of, I truly think about preparation and course planning and even simple things like what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? Where's the wind direction going to come from? Is that going to change my start lines? I mean, that to me is about playing golf and creating a strategy. Awesome. Uh, it's been great connecting with you. I've known Rick for, it's been almost 30 years. Can you believe it's been 30 years, Rick? I, where does time I, go? I know. Cause I, I, cause you were one of the first people on the, on the internet and I signed yes. up for all your, your, uh, weekly and monthly emails. And man, I was just soaking it in and got all your books. And then when you had the certification, I signed up and learned so much and, uh, we've been able to, to stay connected. And if I have, uh, ideas or, uh, you know, I've thrown them your way to get your feedback. Cause I have so much respect for what you're doing. So I've been talking with Rick Sessinghaus. Um, if you want to learn more about Rick, I think he also has a website at ricksessinghaus.com and um, his new program, flowcode.golf. It integrates everything, the mental and the physical, and um, uh, Rick knows what he's doing. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>